Greetings, everyone. So um, we're going to go uh, first proceed with a Saturday morning Gray Area Festival tradition. And how this works is I'm going to say good morning, and then nobody's going to say anything. And then I'm going to say good morning louder, and then everybody's going to get, you know. <laughs> so like, good morning, everyone. And you and say, good morning. Thanks for being here. There we go. Now we're. Now we're with us. Um, who saw a yacht last night? Yay. Uh, it was a fantastic day yesterday. I don't know uh, how many people were all here all day yesterday. We had some uh, wonderful talks all across the board and are happy to be here again. I don't know if I have anything in terms of morning announcements besides the uh, already completed audience engagement. Um, so we're going to start out today with sort of a recap of a project uh, that a huge project we undertook um, from like 2018 up until the beginning of 2020, uh, which was an artist lab, the Experiential Space Research Lab, um, group of 12 artists um, on a project that was initially supported uh, by the Knight Foundation um, and in conjunction with uh, Spherical Studios slash Gaian Systems, who we're going to have remotely on the call here, um, which culminated in an exhibition called The End of You. Um, I'm going to start out here by showing uh, a very short documentary that was made by a couple of great filmmakers. Um, Madav, I don't remember Madav's last name, so I gotta look at it. Sorry, uh, Madav Neopathy and Paul Willett, um to kind of give an overview of what happened, uh, and then I have a couple of short clips from uh, an artist who was kind of a uh, little bit of a patron saint of the project, Newton Harrison, who with uh, his partner Helen Meyer Harrison down at the Center for the Force Majeure in. Um, Santa Cruz uh, visited the exhibition and I think had some great quotes to short little interview clips to sort of um, frame our conversation here. Then I'll invite up our panelists and we'll get going. So here's the film. I think, I think this sounds my fault. Gray Area Foundation for the Arts catalyzes creative action for social transformation. In partnership with the Knight Foundation, we launched the Experiential Space Research Lab to explore the rising trend in experiential art and apply it towards some of the most critical issues facing our world. The 11 selected artists spent six months co-creating The End of You, an exhibition that asks visitors to reimagine their relations with other humans, other species, and our living planet. We're cataloging material evidence from the past 3,000 years of humanity, so the objects and things that humans have created that will live beyond us for years past. By taking these objects out of context and displaying them next to each other in scenarios that you would never see them, the next step is to investigate your behaviors. What we're trying to get you to think about is like why they're here, why we use them, why we've created them. Is this object me? Who am I without it? This is an immersive game of life, and it's an immersive reimagining of Conway's game of life. But the simulation itself is already living. This is putting it into the space and making it interactive and responsive to human presence. Your presence may alter it in very persistent ways, but it too has a life of its own that will change what you experience in turn. talk about the environment and our relationship to it, I think it's really important to remember that these aren't abstract concepts. There's no better case study than Hunter's Point because what makes it dangerous isn't actually visible. They found another radioactive object. This whole project is an attempt to visualize that radiation. These lights are actually completely made of the headlines from the SF Bayview. 
also they're lit with the data from that object that was found last September. My art has always included some aspect of nature, some aspect of geometry. It was inspired by a lot of experiences playing outside, playing with my own sense of space, playing with how I engage with the world around me. I play a lot with the user's perception of space. I try to bring nature into technology and try to approach the human relationship with the environment through technology. I think that's the role of the artist, is to point at things that are present in our realities but aren't always something we tune into. Immersive installation is one of these opportunities to really take you out of your usual experience and to disorient you or reorient you to a new way of thinking. I wanted to allow people to think beyond their ego and really experience that feeling as you connect to the larger living systems around you. We need to be humble in our appreciation of where we are in this world. What came out of the space age, one of the biggest findings that is rarely acknowledged, is the idea that the Earth is alive. And the notion of the Earth being alive and self-regulating was something that we've been exploring, asking ourselves, how can we think like a living planet? What are the implications for thinking of all of ourselves as a consortia, all of ourselves as part of nested scales of this larger system, as well as being consortia of all of these other species and organisms inside of us? And what are the implications of that in terms of how we're relating to the world, and what role can art really help to play in really starting to dissolve and transcend those boundaries? It's the end of you and the beginning of us. break everything no well now i didn't um so cool uh you can see there's a lot that go on there and it, it really transformed the space um i just wanted to like i said play a couple of these small clips from uh newton harrison who visited the exhibition if you don't know his work with uh helen meyer harrison definitely take a look they've been doing environmental um artworks for you know more than 50 years, so um, just a couple short words by our pal Newton, who also gave a keynote at one of the Gray Area festivals. I guess it was either 2016 or 2017. The question, can, how do you go about uh, encouraging the regeneration of the Gulf of New Mexico? You see, that's the scale we've got to get at. Um, if I have a critique of all art shows, not just this one. Um, it's that we haven't yet found the way to jump out of the gallery and into the real world. Um, uh, Helen and I actually have. We actually have done this. but uh, And we're successful at it. But we have to say that out of 50 years' work, four pieces are successful at it. You know what I mean? I don't want to, I, 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 I believe in self-praise, but I also don't believe in making something bigger than it really is. Uh, and we found real hard to, to break out. Sweden does this. They've invited us to redesign their country from an ecological perspective. Um, we suddenly understood no one would buy our work. Why? What rich person wants on his wall somebody tell, who tells them they're fucking up the environment and change now?
you know, they don't want to see that. So, so we decided to um, focus on the real world stuff, commissions like that, and we decided to focus on the on critics. And if you look at the at a hundred books on 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 this field, Helen and I'll be in about sixty or seventy of them, um, because we decided to play for the intelligence and not play for the glory. Um, and then glory came by anyway. But it then. The thing about glory is very peculiar because from say like 1976 to 79, we were in 150 group shows. Everybody wanted a piece of it. 1980, Regan comes in, takes out the money, and we have one show. So our field is very fickle. So why do you think that it's important for you to approach that kind of subject through art as opposed to, because you could be a public planner or like a land, Oh no, you know, oh no, a lot no, of no, things no, I could not. Design the, well, one could approach this No, not me. Well, Under any circumstances. I'm asking about you. I will yeah. answer that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If I am any of those things, other people control my agenda. If I'm an artist, I make the agenda. Or Helen and I when we're mm -hmm. working together. And therefore, um, it's entirely different from being in a, in a field that has rules. I make my own. And you can see it piece by piece. That's, the, that's, the, that's why it's OK to be poor. Um, what, what, where's your payoff? Um, the payoff is you, you're, you're a free agent. On top of that, you're paid to do what nature does. Everything in life improvises its existence. So do we artists. If you take a look at the Bauhaus problems, which I taught from, I taught Albers course at Yale and other things like that. Um, I knew Albers, I, and I knew some of the Bauhaus people. I was actually helped. All right, there, there's Newton. Um, invite my panelists up here to join me. We got, where are you? Are, you, are they here? I don't know. <laughs> uh, we have our, uh, Couple of artists from the from the project, Yulia Pinkovich, uh, Kevin Moultrie Die, and our creative development director at Gray Area, Nikki Selkin. Um, and we're just going to talk about this thing. Oh, and I'm sorry. Remotely from the beyond uh, is David McConville and Don Danby hey. of uh, Spherical. Behind Hi. us, very looming, That's largely. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, just quickly for the start of this project, I, so Knight Foundation asked us to, if everybody remember, it can like rewind a couple of years ago, um, there's Museum of Ice Cream, there's the Van Gogh, there was this um, surge in immersive exhibitions. Um, and that's interesting for a couple of reasons. And one of those is it signaled this shift from people interested in objects to people interested in environments. And like, what's that mean? You know, for museums and you know institutions. Uh, the other thing was it's the first time that I've seen that people would line up around the block to pay you know uh, fifty dollars to get into an exhibition. Um, and so there was this idea that there was this new revenue stream for artists that were coming. Um, and the, the punchline of this whole thing is that we opened it in February of 2020. And then we'll talk about like what that means in relation to today. But maybe, Nikki, you could talk just a little bit about the process leading up to when we started the lab, kind of what we did. And yeah. So um, we, like Barry had said, we'd gotten a grant from the Knight Foundation to explore experiential spaces, which is like immersive environments. And there was a huge trend, everything from the, yeah, the Museum of Ice Cream downtown to Meow Wolf, um, employing, you know, hun tens of and hundreds even of artists from our local community full time which was like such a big a big change for people living hand to mouth. And so we, we did a bunch of research. We sent out surveys um, to all of the artists in the community and, and patrons as well, people that go see these immersive experiences and pop-up museums and try to kind of take away <coughs> some findings around like what were the types of experiences that were most popular. We actually have a pretty good data set of research on this, which was super exciting and meaningful at the time. And then we also did an open call where we found um, 
was it 12, 13, 12, yeah, 12 artists who we picked from all different disciplines uh, to create a collaborative uh, immersive experience over the course of not quite a year, I want to say six months, eight months maybe. And the, the catch, the best part about it was we asked them all to come up with an idea and the application that they wanted to do. And then as soon as they, we selected them, we're like, now throw it in the trash and you're gonna <laughs> work on something totally new and you're gonna find it out together. And the theme <laughs> was living systems, which is how we brought in um, Don and David uh, to, to help us understand what that meant. So that's kind of like the background and the framing to where when the lab started. Yeah, maybe uh, David and Don uh, maybe um, could recollect a little bit what the uh, process was of. And the thing that we did is the night, you know, the Knight Foundation grant was about these experiential spaces, but then somehow we had to make it like more complicated than we needed to, right? And so it wasn't just that we wanted to make an immersive exhibition, but try and think about what the format of these immersive exhibitions could communicate in a way that was beyond what some more, you know, typical, typical forms of, well, even, or objects in a museum, or like, you know, what can be communicated through this form thematically. Um, I don't know, spherical, do you have any, how did, I don't remember, how did this happen, you know? <laughs> We've always got thoughts. Um, well, I think, Barry, we were discussing for some time the Gaian Systems project that we'd been working on <clears throat> with Bruce Clark, who's a bit of a historian of the history of cybernetics. <clears throat> and we were discussing sort of the connection between cybernetic research and a lot of what had been emerging with media art in the 1960s was cybernetic serendipity, sort of the origins of AI and all kinds of things. But that was also feeding into this emerging realm of planetary sciences, particularly Earth system science and the influence of cybernetics on the thinking of James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis. And we were really trying to tease out these you know, common origins in a way that hadn't necessarily been explicitly connected in various ways. Most of the time people think of Gaia theory as kind of a, you know, almost like a spiritual, religious kind of commitment to a living planet, when in fact it was extraordinarily deep science that was challenging a lot of the ideas of what Earth was at the time. And so we were in discussion around what does it mean to sort of explore that, to examine that in a contemporary context, especially with the capacities that we've got now for experiential media art. And it just seemed like a good match for what was going on. But there was also an aspect of um, of the fact that the work in Gaian Systems was really trying to understand how living systems on the planet function with humans as part of them. And the really like trying to actually, in some respects, contend with the fact that um, that climate narratives were starting to come through and 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 being expressed through the through the arts in multiple ways, but they're they were rife with cliches and um, and a lot of the time, backed by simplistic understandings of like actually the weirder, more interesting ways that the planet in fact works. And so it was kind of an opportunity we thought to get underneath some of that, not be talking just bluntly about climate and climate activism, but actually like what what are the like weirder dynamics that are happening at all layers of the planet from micro to macro that enable us to even be asking these questions. So that, that kind of, um, there was a bit of a, a reaction against a, a kind of uh, cliche that, you know, that Gaia theory itself has succumbed to over the years because it's sort of been, as David was saying, gets thought of as like more kind of spiritual or woo as opposed to like hardcore research and how could we explore some of that research, play with it, and how might a, a group of artists, some of whom have encountered these ideas, some of whom never had, um, use those as jumping off points to for their for their own collective um, explorations. Yeah, I think that's a great point of so, so starting out trying to not have it be some sort of cliche reimagining of what maybe the cultural, you know, I don't know, mainstream conception of what Gaia theory would look like is like. And so to undertake that, as Nikki said, what we kind of had to do is 
throw everything away from the outset and undertake a deeply collaborative process of design um, that, like I said, we, we as Gray Area really didn't do too much on the curation and this group of artists co-generated an entirely new and cohesive <laughs> exhibition concept from the group. Um, and and it's something that like can't happen, uh, you know, we've spent two years on Zoom or whatever, it's really the kind of thing that's impossible to happen that way. It, I think everybody had to be in the space. So I'm gonna ask, you know, I don't know whoever has thoughts first, but to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that process and like. I have you know, no thoughts. With, no thought, well, yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think it's this, oh, is it on? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think that the thing that's, that's interesting to me is kind of like, because we came on, as Nikki already said, kind of with our own individual concepts of what we had wanted to do in the space. And by the virtue of throwing out all of that stuff and having to kind of reconstitute a new, you know, seamless, cohesive, perfect collective vision, I think that um, it's, it's interesting to me because looking back, that is such an explicitly non-hybrid way of working like before the Zoom calls, before the pandemic and stuff like that, it, like, like you just said, it would have been impossible, but it also kind of left, left us room to also really, really rethink, you know, how we as artists really want to, like how, how much of an abstraction are we gonna make out of these issues that are like really rooted in research and really rooted in science? And how are we going to like communicate that out to people? I think that, I think that that, that process, both of stripping back our own preconceptions of what we wanted to do, and then this kind of added dimension of like, what level of you know, education is this project going to exist at? Like, is this gonna be completely descriptive? Is this gonna be a project that's essentially mapping? Is it gonna be a project that's essentially like a complete abstraction? Is it gonna be a project that's projective about like some sort of possible future? And I think that like, that level of brainstorming um, in this kind of environment, in this kind of experiential field, is something that, that was incredibly challenging and, and was a large part of the process, was really just like figuring out not only how do, you know, it's like herding cats, right? Like not only like 12 completely different, completely individualized, completely actualized people think about this thing, but then also, how are we going to distill not just all of that energy, but the actual concept into something that's not just digestible, but engageable, right? So it, it, it's not just about it being like, oh, I get it, the planet is an organism. It's also about like, okay, but what do we do with it? Like, how do we talk to the planet? How do we communicate with those things? And I think that that, that was probably the, the biggest step, at least for me. Yeah, just to add to that, I think, um the goal initially was to make something that was neither didactic nor um, solely, um, I'm losing my train of thought a little bit. I, I think what we, we, we really didn't want it to be just about spectacle, which I think a lot of immersive art f weighs heavy on. And so of course it was interesting, it was important to us to make an exhibition that looked good and was engaging, but Ultimately, it wasn't just about throwing data at you and particular numbers. I think we ultimately landed at a place of trying to get to a deeper, both emotional feeling, and kind of um, intellectual understanding that went just beyond the data sets. We, we really wanted to engage the individual with these ideas and have you immerse in these particular ideas in a way that kind of left an impression and that it wasn't just a statistic. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a good point about, and I sort of want to talk a little bit about what the, about the immersive format and like what, uh, how that communicated, what you wanted to, you know, how that played into it. But um, there was a very basic thing that was the exhibition that was created called The End of You and sort of the subheadlines, The Beginning of Us, was this determinant of the selfie museum right, a place you just go to take pictures of yourself in the set and then whatever, there's some social socialization on online or whatever. Um, so it's kind of an anti-selfie museum because the purpose of this was to use this environmental context to expand from your sense of self to other people and other species and then a living planet through this kind of 
journey that was undertaken. So I don't know. Um, might be good to talk about both of the installations you made and how those, you know, came into being through that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think one thing that I want to say really quickly about kind of the comparison to the Museum of Ice Cream and, and the Selfie Museum and all the things that were going on specifically here, but also just generally in the art world at that time, I think that um, something that's really interesting to me looking back on, on this project before talking about like our, our specific installs, like, is that something that I always found fascinating about the Museum of Ice Cream was how little explanation it really required, right? And, and, and all, of these, all of these places that you go to, you don't go there and you don't like have to like walk and like read wall text and be like, hmm, what's a vanilla bean? You know, it's like, you know, you already know what ice cream is, you know what a museum is, and the, the very verbiage of the whole concept is really immediately understandable. And we were, it, we were really kind of tasked with like, okay, but like we're not gonna have something that's immediately reducible to a single sentence to like wall text, right? So we're working in this intermediary between a typical art installation where you have the ability to have wall text, to have descriptive liner notes or whatever, um, and, and with a thing where it's like, how can we communicate this directly through the art object, through the install, without people having to read something about it, right? Um, so, um, so in my specific case, you know, my, my project was all about um, the radioactivity um, that is still present to this very day at Hunter's Point. And it was, it was kind of inspired by conversations that I had had with a lot of journalists from the SF Bayview um, and other uh, black newspapers in the Bay Area about how they've been talking about this situation for a very, very long time to like literally shine a light on this problem. But it wasn't really until all the money started pouring in to redevelop Hunter's Point that people started really looking into it. And right before um, we had actually started really working on this project, they had found another radioactive object. It was a deck marker, um, just like on the ground in Hunter's Point. It's like highly radioactive. And so my, my part of the install was kind of focused on how do we communicate the harm that this has um, to people without making it like, you know, I always think about like old, older epic movies that always start with like a, a text description where it's like, the year is 1959. You know, like the Soviets have just, you know, and, and it's like, how can I, how can I get that effect without having it to be immediately, you know, like, like how can I get it to be immediate without it being reductive, I guess. And so, and so the solution for me, and I think a lot of us looking back at our installs was I created a series of these lanterns that were kind of programmed to blink on and off with the help of somebody who, very incredible, here to help, like, a, she basically did it. It's actually uh -huh. not I'm, I'm really Michael. my project. It's Nikki, actually... Nikki soldered a lot of uh, cables. I, spent, I was awake for like 24 hours at one point with <laughs> Michael, myself, and the audience who also, we worked together on the code. We, but just to explain it real quick because it's cool, we found, um, Kevin found the radio frequency data from someone from the LA Times of the signatures from the radioactivity and we used that to translate that into LED patterns into the LED lanterns that were also from the print, there was like vellum printed from the... Yeah, so like we, on, on these lanterns that were made of this semi-translucent vellum, we printed all the headlines that people had been printing about this problem for years and years and years. So it was like the radioactivity and the work that had already been done by these communities was going to literally illuminate uh, the space in this. And didn't we get a Geiger counter? <laughs> so, no, we, we had. had some, yeah, we had an actual <laughs> Geiger counter. Yeah. yeah, it was cool, and and a stolen sign that said to "Keep out Hunter's Point." I still have that sign. Yeah, it's so cool. Unless the government asked, then I don't know. No, what we to doesn't. It. We never saw that sign. No, it was here. It was awesome, but but I. <laughs> In anyway, the documentary. Yeah. But I think the thing that was cool about that piece, too, that Kevin made and we like helped realize together was that it visualized a literal data of harm from a planetary time scale, like like toxic, you know, toxic, a radioactive material in a very both data specific way, but fun and interesting way because it was like a really cool lantern light sculpture and also dealt with societal harm. You know, so it was dealing on a lot of levels. It was dealing with like immediate societal harm and it was dealing with um, radioactive time scale and, and earth, you know, earth 
stuff that that was something that Dave and um, Don and Jonathan were talking a lot about, like expanding time. And, and I think, and, and the last thing I'll say is that I think what a lot of us realized, maybe even more specifically, you and I, is that there is there was a, a part of what had to happen ended up having to be descriptive in, in some way, shape, or form. And it was really about leaving the right amount of room for an individual or the audience to engage either deeper or not. So it's like, with mine specifically, you could just interact with it as like, ooh, pretty lights, or you could actually go up and read the lanterns and be like, oh, okay. And like, you could read the sign and, and really having that kind of like levels of information from different distances. Um, and a lot of our projects, um, including uh, two people uh, that are not unfortunately here right now, uh, Celeste and Bees, uh, who are also part of a collective, or a formerly, formerly part of a former collective called Space Industries, um, that uh, that project, was all about the, you saw it in the documentary, the Museum of like Human Nature, I think it was called. And, and it's the archive, yeah. And, and I think it was, uh, it was really incredible because you could just look at it as a combination of like dildos and barber chairs and all these other things. But if you really wanted to get into it, you know, there's, there's like levels to it. And I think your project also had uh, a very similar thing where it's like there, there are layers of engagement. And it's actually, determining those layers that I think really determines how successful it is as an interactive uh, piece. <laughs> so my project was titled The Luxuriant Prolific Undying. And I think it was, um, it came from the premise that humans are somehow separate from nature, that we, you know, embody parts of the world and society, and then there's nature, and the pristine nature's over here, and humanity's over here, and I felt like that is a really incorrect way of thinking about us. We are obviously part of the ecological system, and I, and I wanted to build a project around that premise of trying to kind of reintegrate humanity back into nature, back into the living systems that Earth is, you know, that we are part of. And so um, that, I ended up, realizing that what ultimately is driving this idea of us separate from nature is our egos. And the, the, in order for us to be able to connect more with our surroundings and our non-human kin, we need to work on dissolving our egos a little bit. And the project um, ultimately took on the form of essentially a death meditation underneath two specific tree roots that were sourced locally one was a cedar, one was an alder. Both of these trees have very specific um, interconnected systems. They have a lot of medicinal properties. You know, we can go on and on. Essentially, um, people were invited to lay down or sit next to these roots and literally like smell the earth on these things, the oils coming out of these um, roots. And um, in, well, and then I had my wonderful collaborators, Don and David, Spherical Studios worked on writing um, text and recording this really beautiful audio guided meditation essentially that led you through a dissolution of your ego, let's say. Um, and it was one was about five minutes, so you can kind of engage just a little bit, or one was a little deeper, I think it was 11 minutes where you really lay down. And the thing that I found happening was a lot of people really did kind of lay down, they relaxed, a lot of people fell asleep underneath these trees. Some people even spent the night one time. Um, <laughs> a particularly difficult install day. Rent is very high here. It's, you know. <laughs> yes. Um, the trees were situated on about 2,000 pounds of salt as well, and so there was like this bed of salt that you got to play with, and everything was very tactile, but the materiality was very specific. There was an array of oak galls that were sourced from a you know a local tree that were kind of hung up like little balls that kids like to play with, but then they kind of created the suspended moment of animation. And uh, I'm not sure what else to say. Well, I mean, I think I think something that I, I always really liked about about your piece that I think is is worth mentioning is that like you know I can't think of anything more different from the Museum of Ice Cream than an ego death meditation under a dying tree. <laughs> and I think and I think that the the challenge that we had, right, is is like how to make, you know, experiencing your ego dissolving as much fun as taking a very good photo for the gram um, in a pit of sprinkles, right? And I think that like 
one of the solutions that you found that I think is really different from one of the solutions that I engaged with, which was yours was a lot about tactility, right? So it's about, you know, there's a different material on the ground, there's a different material in the air, like with the smells, and there's a different material that you're engaging with. Whereas mine was much more closer to the spectacle side, right? It's not something that people can even really touch or can really engage with except for visually, right? But in, in such a way that it would be difficult to, to, I think a lot about the, the infinity rooms that popped up a lot um, during that time and how they're designed not just for you to be able to experience them, but also for you to photograph them, take those photographs home, perpetuate that image, and then like kind of like reproduce itself. But the way that, that the, the my installation was hung kind of made it difficult to get a photo of it or make, makes it difficult to experience in that kind of way. Right, but at the same time, it's still a highly visual, highly spectacle process, right? And so there are a couple of other um, installs that I'm just going to talk briefly through because I think it's it's important and they're, and they're not here. But you know, um, Stephanie's install, which was kind of in this space, which was like a huge interactive multi-screen uh, video game that as you moved through the floor on, in the floor, it kind of represented Conroy's game of life for those science nerds out there. Mm -hmm. And and so that was another thing that was like hovering in between actual tactility in terms of material and then kind of like a virtual visual tactility, right? Because you're not actually touching things, but you're changing things simply by moving through. There was like this uh, geodesic dome designed by Orestes, who, which was like, had projected on it, essentially like this kind of Charles Eames, um, you know, like powers of 10 scaling up and down the-, the With the AI. Dome. Yeah. Yeah, it was AI um, landscapes where he trained a model before we had Dolly in Mid Journey to, oh, yeah. um, he fed it many, many images of nature and then, they had, there was one panel on the geodesic dome that had actual, the images flipping, and then all the rest were AI models of what the AI saw as nature. Right, and so, and then, and then, as you saw in the video, the kind of electric force, which was like a projection on the sides of the walls that kind of brought in this kind of naturalized, but also completely synthesized environment into the, the space in general. St Steven, yeah, Steven did that. And, and so I think like, all of these have different kind of ways of engaging, and it was really important to have all of those different ways in different kind of parts of the floor plan in order to like get people to engage with all of them at their respective level, right? So like once again, kind of setting up these different levels. And then, and then the archive, which I already mentioned, but was also incredibly tactile, like all of that stuff was presented in a way where it wasn't, there was no barrier to entry. You could just pick something up, you could just take it. And you, you could know. add your own things and you can tag them and write the date and the time and add them to the archive. In, in fact, uh, the person that, the, the clip that you just showed, he, he tagged himself. So he, was, yeah. he's, he archived himself. Uh, and, Newton, Newton Harrison Newton, yeah. <laughs> archived himself. Yeah, so that archive was crowd, sort, that there was a sort of social component where the things in the archive were crowdsourced from whoever wanted to, <laughs> to bring them in, right? And so I think like speaking to kind of like this meow wolf aspect of these kinds of things, it's not just the amount of information that has to be considered, but also the, all of the different ways, like all of, like engaging every single sense, right? From smell and touch to visual to auditory. And we haven't even talked about probably the most in, informative piece. Um, I forgot what it, what it was called, but the one that was in the... Um, the, um, oh my gosh, we're Kelly's. About, we're talking about Kelly's. Kelly's, the, why can I not think of it? It's room of Relations. Room, room of Relations. Rela <laughs> or the Room of Revelations, if you. <laughs> yeah, talk about it real quick. Yeah. Thank you, Zordon. Uh, yeah, sure. Kelly, um, Kelly, who'd actually worked with Newton and Helen for many years, um, was exploring the concepts of uh, Earth jurisprudence, rights of nature, this whole idea that we're in this, you know, era of recognition of the sort of the colonial legal nature of how we think about personhood and the absurdities of our ability to grant corporations personhood in all these various ways, but the difficulties of actually even relating to other entities and beings that are non-human uh, to see their inherent personhood. And a lot of particularly indigenous communities around the world have been focused on, and not just indigenous communities, actually like very conservative American communities as well, but looking at the focus on how to grant rights of uh, personhood to rivers and mountains and forests and rice 
And Kelly's piece really explored the various ways in which that's been emerging over the past number of years. And, and to just quickly describe that install, it, it was it was probably the most informative of all of the installs. So like there were there were like papers and documents so that you could at your own leisure like engage with all the different kind of legal ramifications and like the documents related to the rights of nature and things like that, along with another uh, kind of projected piece that was on these series of like kind of fabric sales that was also quite beautiful and, and engaging. But it, it like once again was another way of engaging that was m more akin to like a library or like a reading room than any of the pieces in this in this main space, right? So it's like we, we had all of these different ways so that way the viewer or the audience member could kind of like attach to whatever it was that they gravitated towards the most and then having that consistent thread through all of it so that way you could you could kind of pick and choose, yeah. And we should also mention, I, I think the last one we didn't mention was Romy's out in the registry. front, which was the registry, which was a touch screen installation that the you, um, sort of assumed a new identity that was your kind of like, went through a survey question process and then got this new identity that was some uh, other you, species that was you related. You merged with another species. You merged with another species, yeah. I think species. that's what yeah. it was. Yeah, it was yeah. like rocks, you wanted plants. To merge with and then you became a hybrid of and those. It, and it issued you an ID card, right? So and like you got an ID card, So it issued you an ID card as like a tree. So you'd be like, I really like trees. And then it would like use AI <laughs> to like turn you into bark. And then it'd be like, here's your new self. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. And that was the first thing that you did actually before you even came to all this other stuff where you killed your ego and stuff. So I think, I feel like it was like a really, <laughs> it, was, it was kind of intense the more I actually think about it. Yeah, yeah it was intense. <laughs> um, spherical, I wanted to ask you both, maybe if you had any thoughts on the guided meditation process, since that was a big part of the, the whole experience, but also since you both, um, I think, are, folks who are most directly still, you know, currently working in tangible environmental projects in LA to maybe talk for a second about how, if at all, the experience of doing this influenced what you're working on now or thinking about the policy things you're working on? Yeah, happy, we're happy to riff on that. I mean, I think it, it was it was such a delight to be able to collaborate with Yulia um, and also with Stephen, who did a lot of the, the background projections of the work that he was doing. So it was sort of a piece um, that included, you know, four four people with with Yulia's um, installation and sculpture with the trees kind of at the center. And so David and I, as, as Yulia was saying, was we're, we're working on the um, the audio, and uh, you can hear my my voice completely distorted at the beginning of that documentary that that was shared earlier. But we um, what we were playing with, as Yulia was saying, was really along the the lines of the dissolution between um, humans and other and like non-human entities. Um, and it's you know the, we've many times talked about the fact that this all was happening and being installed at a time when we were aware that there was this pandemic kind of vaguely happening culturally away from San Francisco. Um, and so it had this, this wild effect of like very soon after we closed the show being like, we were lying on the ground in salt, breathing air next to other people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like uh, not wearing masks. I mean, the, just the, the bizarre like turn that, that happened very, very soon afterward. And I've joked a lot about how it felt like um, by, you know, in effect writing an, uh, a meditation that was from the voice of the non-human other that we were speaking as the kind of un, um, non-human living systems in the planet, that what was it that we were summoning through that, the ritual of creating that, that piece and that experience for all those people. It's all your fault, uh, you did this. We've, it, it, we've taken responsibility for it a couple of times. <laughs> so, yes. and, and appreciate, um, appreciate Kevin for, for uh, coming up with the, with the original framing of the end of you also, because it just felt like so perfect for that particular moment. Um, but I mean, creating that and, uh, and being able to, to, to have people have a space where they could drop in, um, and, and, uh, and spend time quietly. was a real, was a real delight, but David, do you want to, do you want to speak to like where that's, how that's evolved, like where, where we've gone with it? Because our studio really is based in almost everything we do dances in some way with 
sky and systems, technology, ecology, um, and right now looking on at living infrastructure uh, in Southern California. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, very specifically pulling on the themes of relationality and the sort of the centrality of understanding relations, how we relate to all of you know each other, but also the non-human world, how explicit that's become. I mean, Nikki was addressing this recently on a call, like how isolated people became, all the different challenges, what it means to be like ripped from your web of relations in a tangible way, um, <clears throat> where everything kind of becomes virtualized. And a lot of the work that we're doing now is looking at particularly water infrastructure in California and the history of how water has been treated uh, kind of post three phases of colonialism and what it takes to kind of address the nature of this embodied infrastructure. Um, and as we've gotten more and more into it, the clearer it's become, like our ideas around infrastructure are so anti-relational. It's something that's seen as like, that's this top-down thing that comes in and the, the consistent theme that we keep encountering is that infrastructures that actually work are deeply relational. It's the community creating those infrastructures from the inside, maintaining them, regenerating them. And I think that that actually speaks back to the original themes that we were playing with, with cybernetics and sort of earth system science, because cybernetics itself, there was this sort of idea of allopoetic systems, which are kind of created from the outside, and then autopoetic systems that are created from the inside. And so the richness of this experience, I think, of the installation was it was very much about being on the inside. It wasn't just kind of a, you know, a machine control feedback loop system that was being controlled from somewhere else. It was about your own participation and aspects of that. And so there, I don't know, there are ripple effects. There are like manifestations of the importance of that relationality and just about everything that we're doing these days. But all, the, all the work really does involve trying to bring forth an accessibility around things that are anti-relational, like everything Kevin was working on, looking at Hunter's Point and, um, and the deep, you know, historic um, environmental justice considerations that, and issues that happened there. Those are, um, it's a, just a deeply anti-relational dynamic. And we, we see that all across California are these systems um, where decisions or infrastructures were built without consideration of the life systems, including the, the life systems of the communities that were there. And so a lot of our work right now is, is you know, part of the, the larger effort to unwind those systems, to bring back the health, to bring back the relationality. Um, and that's like the relationality with the with the green spaces and the trees and the ability to catch water and hold it in the land, which is a big part of, of the, the functional aspect of what we're doing. But to do that, it has to be done in a way that's deeply connected to the voices of the people in communities, um, which is, you know, all a constant challenge is like, how do you not see infrastructure as uh, is completely top down and control based and paternalistic and colonial and instead something that is that can be co created um, for healing in communities. And so I think there's there's many threads of um, of what we were exploring that show up in all these different pieces, um, which are really part of one big piece that uh, that play with a lot of those same same themes. It's probably worth mentioning the inordinate amount of time that we spent sort of in fisticuffs <laughs> in the lab around some of these ideas, right? Like we were exploring all kinds of concepts of like, what would it mean to give the Bay a voice? What would it mean to create different types of legal structures that recognized the personhood of different things? I mean, and it got, it got pretty intense in the lab because everybody had pretty strong opinions about things. And, it, and I, I don't know, I was amazed when, you know, Kevin came up with a, the central concept and everybody kind of gelled around and like, okay, good, we got it. But that was pretty, deep into it was into to incorporate Gaia we wanted to incorporate the earth that was our big concept we landed on after a year of meeting yeah we, we met we met for a really 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 long time and there was a, a really long time an incredibly long time and um for from the human scale and and I think and I, we had a lot of conversations about exactly what um, I think Newton talks about um, in the clip, which is like, how do we get this outside the gallery? Like how much of this exists outside the context of this room? And some of our first conversations, as, as I just mentioned, is like, okay, well, do we actually want the impact of this to be like a legal impact? Like, do we actually, do we actually go out and like try to create a situation where 
we forced the you know this the local municipal government to start granting rights to like these things in the streets and and how do we have like off-site um instantiations of this and and like there was there was a phase where we were talking about incorporating Gaia and it was going to be called like everything incorporated like a company and and you know we had all these slide decks and stuff like that and I think that uh, we we pulled back a little bit because we realized that we needed to control our own scale of what we wanted to do in order to be able to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish because if we had this kind of like massive undertaking that like spanned the entire you know city of San Francisco, there was a risk that we weren't going to be able to accomplish it, and it was going to be worse if it was you know half-assed, right? And so we wanted to make sure that we were able to kind of like focus all of our energies and accomplish actually because you know I think so Jonathan Keats was a huge huge advocate of like a kind of uh, an art installation that was essentially a, a legal project, right? Like. A, a legal framework for accomplishing all these things. And it was something that we were all incredibly interested in, but it became it became evident really quickly, like, okay, but like, how does how does this become something that people can engage with? And and because at the end of the day, you know, our competition isn't Mayor London Breed, even though maybe it should be, it's it's actually, you know, the Museum of Ice Cream, right? And so like and and splitting that difference between between those things took a, a very long and, time. Yeah, and the unmerciful eye of the public you know people have to come in here and have a good t you know and like enjoy it and be immersed right so um i was just gonna say yeah, ultimately so you know the show was open for what three weeks i think and five thousand people came to see it so i i think it had a pretty massive impact in terms of art the scale of art exhibitions and the amount of people that walk through it and we've got a lot more, time. like, just for gray areas, you know, metrics. Generally, we our largest audience um, is between the ages of, like, I'd say, for my first studies, 25 to maybe 50. And so um, it was really great that we got a lot of families in through that. We had a lot of children in here for the first time I've ever seen a lot of children in gray area. And I think that having the um, open and immersive exhibit, also having the idea of living systems and, and, and pulling in everyone at different walks of life and different stages, it just, it made it more accessible and it was really reached a wider audience than what we what we normally reach. So it was successful in that way. Yeah, and the, the other thing about that, just to mention it, uh, Part of what we were prototyping here was an economic model to do collaborative group situations, and so we also did a direct profit share with all the artists for all of the, you know, quote unquote profit from this show. And so that it, uh, we had enough people in that that turned out to be significant, um, and I think really affected our thinking of how we structure agreements with, you know, and um, yeah. collaborative projects with artists from that. In moving forward throughout COVID, we started doing like 50-50 profit shares for workshops, for example, to support the artists who had lost a lot of their income and revenue streams. And I would say that that was a direct direct repercussion of the success of this show and really kind of trying to rethink how we can engage with artists and relational engagement with our community uh, to support them and help them thrive, particularly as we all face COVID together, you know. And we're just getting cooking with gas here, but unfortunately, I think we're out of it. Any, any parting thoughts for these wrong fine metaphor. people? To, yeah? I just said wrong metaphor. <laughs> it's an induction stove. We're not, we're not cooking with gas. Give me a, give me a better metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> a question for the ages. Give me a better metaphor. Yeah, sorry. I'm going to just read the word. I feel like it was good transinduction work, and we were... <laughs> <laughs> the good fortune of, of being able to do it with you all. I, I, I just want to say it's so good to see you guys on the big screen. I miss you guys. And it was it was a really, it was awesome. It was an awesome experience to do. And I think that, I guess if I had any last thing to say, it would be that I think, you know, the, the, the coolest thing about it, kind of like what Nikki just said, is that like there, there were so many ways for so many different types of people to get introduced to this stuff. And like I, I still wonder sometimes like what's what's the long term effect of having, you know, like a toddler do a death meditation under like a, an alder tree, you know, or like what's 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 the long term effect of having a five year old look at like a Geiger counter reading of radioactivity in their in their city. And I think that in, in this sense, you know, if, if the goal of the project was to shift and rethink some of the relationals, 
like the relations that we have between art object community. Like I think that in that sense, it was in incredibly effective and I'm, I'm really excited about that and was really proud to do that work with everybody here. So yeah, thank you guys. Here, here. Yes. Yeah, and thank you, Barry and Nikki and the whole crew and all the artists for like taking a chance on this. It was truly <laughs> experimental and experiential. <laughs> Risk taking is what we do here. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so we're going to do a quick tech rearrangement here and uh, be back with DeForest.